Hello, everybody, and welcome to this segment of Data Science Simplified. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to my good friend, David Weekly. He is the founder of, and CEO of Medcoder, a free app that helps patients and families understand and communicate about medical encounters. He's also the founder and chairman of Hacker Dojo, a Silicon based valley, a Silicon Valley based nonprofit community center that brings together tech learners from all works of life. He lives in Redwood City, California with his two sons, Maxwell and Cyrus, and his kick-ass wife, Rebecca, who is the director at Intel, responsible for cloud strategy. David has a CS degree from Stanford and holds a PADI rescue diver certification, along with drone helicopter and fixing and fixed wind pilot license. Wow, that's a mouthful. Hello, David. Welcome to Data Science Simplified. Well, thanks for having me, Reggie. Thanks. Thank you for uh, agreeing to come on. So today we are going to talk about real world data, right? And why don't you start off by giving us examples of real world data and what sort of information should our view viewers have in mind when they think about real world data? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of the big problem with uh, pr practical real world applications of everything from uh, machine learning to just even database engineering is that the real world has got data that's not as nicely structured as you'd like it to be. And that's from a mixture of different things. So that can be from a collection error. Uh, if somebody put in information in a different format than you were expecting, it can be from different systems reasoning about data in different ways and therefore needing to translate across those systems. It can come from uh, noise in the data. There's all sorts of different ways that the data can end up kind of wacky. So a good example of this, um, there, there's mi literally millions of examples of this, um, is around, um, uh, in our product, we wanted to let people auto-complete a doctor name. So we wanted to have all of the doctors in the United States of America. And uh, to get currently licensed doctors, we went to each of the different states licensing boards to go and download from them a list of, show me all the current medical professionals who are licensed in your state. Um, and simple things like, uh, is, does first name include the doctor, like DR period prefix, or do you put that in the uh, prefix column uh, of the CSV? Um, or is that in the professional title column or, oops, actually in 15 records, that was the last name. The last name went in the first name, and then the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the things are, are all scrambled up, right? Uh, what about capitalization, even, things like that? What about zip code? Is it, is it five digits? Is it five dash four? Is it just nine digits all squished together? Um, do they zero pad if the zip code starts with a zero or do they just cast it to a number? Um, so you get a number that's only four digits long when you were expecting a five digit zip code, right? And these things are all possible to build rules for, but where things get exciting is if in one data set, you've got uh, a very unequal sort of intermixing of these because people built that data set they gave you from a whole bunch of different sources and didn't bother to homogenize it, right? Um, and so you have to end up figuring out uh, how to organize this. So um, fun example from this was in, in one of these data sets we were parsing, we were trying to get the physician's first name and last name. Should be easy, right? And so it turned out that it was much harder than anticipated because uh, a bunch of people put their credentials you know, comma, credential, comma, credential, comma, credential, sometimes just space credential, space credential. Um, and so a DO is uh, one such medical title that somebody can have. Uh, and sure enough, as I was cleaning things up, uh, I ran across an individual, a licensed medical professional, whose last name was DO, who was a, wait for it, D.O. <laughs> like, I'm fine, right? You know, but I, as you go to clean up and normalize and homogenize a data set, um, you, you'll run into a, a flurry of these edge cases. And, and at some point, you, 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 do, you are faced with the question of the return on effort and the labor in terms of how much is it worth to you to preserve every record 
um, versus throwing out some where the normalization is just going to be too difficult. And the answer to that may depend on the problem you're trying to solve um, because you have finite resources. You have a finite amount of time. Now, one thing is that, that, that's really cool is that the set of tools that we have available to us to help clean these data sets are, are continuing to get more sophisticated. So a, a great one that I discovered this year that I love is called Trifecta. And they actually have a partnership with Google Cloud. So if you go to clouddataprep.com, um, you can go and point it at uh, giant multi-gigabyte CSVs that you've got in uh, Google Cloud storage somewhere. Um, you can pull in a bunch of different CSVs, normalize each, join them to each other, deduplicate, de uh, and then write out a giant nicely normalized CSV on the output of that flow. And then you could re-execute that flow anytime you've got new input data that's coming in. So that's just, that's fantastic. And there's a nice user interface around it. So it's sort of like Google Sheets, but instead of meant for something that could have tens of thousands of rows, it's Google Sheets, but meant for something that could have tens of millions of rows, right? Um, and I'm really excited just to see those kinds of tools to help with this work because uh, real world data science, you'll find that 90% of the job is normalizing the data set. And then the remain of the remaining 9% is building a nice regression in some basic heuristics around that normalized data set. And the last 1%, the icing on the cake is using fancy deep learning techniques to go and, and build custom models around this stuff. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Right there. Yes. 90% is really just mangling the data into something that's absolutely useful. It's janitorial. You know, you think you'll be doing hyperparameter tuning and like, really, you're just trying to figure out um, is, is KS here? Does it mean the state of Kansas or does it have other context that, for the meaning KS here? Right. Because that's real world data. Absolutely. And what you find, I imagine you agree with me, is that when you talking about real world data, you're talking about everyday sort of data that everyone uses. And this pertains really, it falls into one sort of category of data with its unstructured data, most yeah. likely. So well, although semi-structured data, somebody presented it to you in a way that they felt was structured, but the structure was a lie. The last <laughs> name did not mean last name. First name did not mean first name always. Some of the time, but not always, right? Right, right. Awesome. So let's move on to the next question. So imagine for a, for a startup for a moment, right? Imagine that you're a startup and as a, by way of example, we can <clears throat> we'll picture a virtual event planning company, for example, right? Yeah. And their clients are national organizations that have moved their annual conference online, right? Picture a conference with a thousand to 2000 attendees, networking, attending different workshops, now, the clients are interested in learning more about how many people attend the conference, which events they attend, whether they buy anything from vendors, yada, 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 the sort of interactions they were having during the conference, either with each other, other vendors, other panelists, right? What sort of data model would you propose for tracking this sort of information from event to event, year to year, um, what sources we use, and how would you outline it in such a manner that it maintains some sort of a true structure, let's use that term, true structure, um, so that it's a real world event data, but something that you can basically gather from different sources and actually make some sort of a useful, intelligent uh, product from. Uh, so it's a good and challenging question. Um, I think some of this is trying to ascertain the business purpose for the collection and maintenance of this data. And if it's for the purpose of tracking qualified lead generations. Um, so you can track it back to, to channel and do channel attribution, um, wh whether that's for customers raising their hands and ending up in a Salesforce pipeline or, or whatever it is. I, I, like with many problems, uh, a product manager like me will first ask, let's make sure we understand the problem before we jump into a solution here, right? Let's make sure that uh, what we're solving for will, will end up meeting the needs for, for all of our uh, users. Um, one interesting bit here, and in this happens with real world conferences, is that there's a lot of interactions that are structured, but then there's a lot that are unstructured. So if I happen to wander by a booth, I don't stop and talk to anyone. I don't give anyone my business card. I don't let anyone scan my badge with the QR code on it. But I walk by, I notice the, the, the company name. I think, hmm, that's interesting. Later, I, I happen to wander by a session where they're presenting. I'm like, okay, that's neat. That night I go into my hotel room 
I, I do a Google search for the term, I find the company, I click, and I end up buying a hundred thousand dollars worth of product from from that company. Well, how do you track that? Like, I, I can register that this individual was on the participant list at this conference where we were presenting, but mapping back attribution becomes very difficult. And it turns out that there's a lot of this sort of bycatch that, that that happens, you know, particularly in uh, an environment like a large conference where you've got a booth and you're a vendor where you, you are, uh, your brand is being seen by a lot more people than you're formally tracking interactions with, right? Um, so there's a couple interesting ways around this. One is that you have um, specialized endpoints, whether they're a special URL or a special phone number that, that, you, that you present during that event, right? And then there's, there's some incentive, there's some reason to use that URL, whether it's a discount or, or something like that. Um, so you hand somebody a flyer, and even if you don't log the structured interaction between them, later you can track back that that user came in through that flyer. Right? That's right. So now to map things back to the question that you actually asked, which was about a virtual event, I would look at using similar techniques where the, 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 the virtual booths that you pass or the virtual talks that you go to all have a special link um, to learn more about that company, that product, et cetera, that can then track back that the, the, the source of this interest was this particular session, was this particular uh, engagement at this time, right? So I'd want to preserve that that attribution data. Um, and thinking about how to link it to an individual, um, th this gets a little interesting as well, because like, do I care about the individual uh, in, in, a per in their personal capacity, or do I care about them vis-a-vis uh, -vis their role at a particular company? Because I'm involved in B2B sales, and that Janice was fired, and now Fred has her job, and he's director of procurement. I don't really care. I'll get to know Fred because like, I want, I, I want the company to buy my stuff. It's less that I'm trying to build a relationship with Janice per se. Right. And so some of it may end up role based where what you want to capture is not the, just the information concerning the individual that you're, you're interfacing with, but that the, the, the higher level bit that there's an individual at this company with this role. And then if that's captured, then you can start building integrations into say your Salesforce pipeline to say like, hey, uh, Janice's email is bouncing. Let's dig through our collective LinkedIn uh, or other pr prior outreach to see if we can find out who's the new Janice, right? Um, so, so that you can establish that relationship. And hey, just so you know, your former colleague, you know, had a chat with us at a conference a year ago. It was going pretty well. She dropped off the map. Now her email's bouncing. So we don't need to talk about her anymore, but I wanna, I, I wanna continue the thread of like, <laughs> Um, oh, how we can be useful to your to your company, right? And so you could you could do a dive and save and a catch there, right? Right. You basically just laid out a roadmap for every person that's hosting a virtual conference in terms of how they can leverage any data or some data that they capture to basically improve uh, their strategy, whatever whatever problem that they're solving, be it in terms of improving sales or some operation optimizations. Those are very useful to tidbits. Yeah, I, I think the big lesson with data is that you, you can't resynthesize data after it's been lost, but you can rejoin it. And right. storage is shockingly cheap. So you should figure out how to make sure that you're preserving any contextual data that you later could possibly want to join around, finding and getting inventive around ways to invent this. Like most people don't know that it's possible to pretty easily programmatically stand up a new phone number and have it go in forward. So um, things that, that, that sound outlandish at first, like we're gonna have a special for our phone number for our, our company that we only give out this phone number at this conference, right? And we'll have the phone number continue to function for up to a year. Um, th then anyone who ever calls in that phone number, we know that the origin of this was that you, you got the phone number at this conference here, right? And that'll cost you a dollar a month to be able to go and do something like that. Special email address, very easy to do. A special uh, website link, very easy to do. Even you can you start seeing people with sophisticated pages um, and sophisticated uh, brand profiles putting up specialized domains, you know, whole websites just for uh, a particular class of engagement. And that makes it pa possible to then track back wh where did we find this person. And so just if you have that data, later you're going to be able to join against it in useful ways, even if you don't know what all of those joins are today. You, you want to capture that data, you want to preserve it so you can join against it. Right. So what we're hearing really, folks, is that context is very important. Preserve that context. 
All right, so moving on, we talk about real world data. Real world data is gonna apply to organizations, small and large, new and old alike, right? So what are the differences you see with when you can think about real world data in terms of the application, use, or management from a small startup versus a large uh, corporate that's existed for a long time? So the, a lot of the complex data problems have been, I'm not going to say solved, but there are systems for solving them that are in place at a large company, right? So there's a joke among software engineers at Google that they hire PhDs in computer science to transform one protobuf into another. <laughs> and, and for the for the less uh, Google software nerd uh, among you, what that means is that in Google they have a way of representing structured information um, called a protobuf, uh, called short for protocol buffer, uh, mm -hmm. that describes a, 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 a down to the byte level structure of what the data is and what's optional, what's mandatory, um, and it can be nested. So you can have protobufs that are enormously complicated, um, and different systems are gonna expect to uh, output data in one format and other systems are gonna expect to ingest data in a different format. So a lot of it is like plumbing where you're getting data that's output in one format and transforming it into data that's input in another segment. Um, so you still have those problems at Google, but the best practices for how do you go about transforming one protobuf into another, the uh, tooling to be able to do that, to test that, to architect that at scale, to flag when, there's a, when there are errors and required fields are not being pro, uh, provided and, and how do you handle that in your pipeline. That's all very mature at that point. At a startup, you're inventing all this stuff from scratch. Um, so I, I would say that that's one thing that's very different. The advantage of the startup is that um, every there's so few people and there's so few steps between data and user that you can always be sure of a, of a clear answer to why the hell am I doing this, right? Who's gonna benefit from, from having this data pipeline work and what are, what are the consequences gonna be if, if it doesn't? At a large company, sometimes you can be uh, responsible for step 47 in 213 steps of, of a data flow pipeline, and you've sort of lost the narrative. You have no idea where the upstream data is coming from. You have no idea who your downstream consumers are. And so you can end up with very surprising artifacts, like um, you know, somebody leaves the company and their manager doesn't think to delegate um, that step 47 to somebody else. Two months later, somebody from accounting comes running in. It's like, what happened to the pipeline? And everyone's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? It's like, well, we, we have our, our, our quarterlies that we're going to be presenting to investors. And one of the key dashboards is actually fueled on a pipeline that your guy broke. That guy, he hasn't worked here for months. Like, <laughs> so so I, I had no idea you were consuming this data, you know, because it's, it, gets, it gets so abstract. You don't have those kinds of problems in small companies because there's just... Uh, too few people and there's too few steps that tend to happen uh, between data ingest and where it actually gets deployed in use somewhere. One other class, I mean, there's other classes of problems around modeling real world complexity that I think many uh, startups, particularly first time startups, might not be familiar with. So I think that there's a whole interesting bit about, well, how complicated could a postal address possibly be? And Oh God, it's, it's a real <laughs> rabbit hole, right? All of your assumptions about what a valid mailing address looks like are wrong. Literally for any like schema that you could produce that sounds reasonable, like, okay, we're gonna have a street number, a street name, a street type, a city, a state, and a zip code. And maybe if we wanna be fancy, we'll throw a county in there and then we've got a ISO 639 to represent country code. Good, I've got the whole world now, right? Like not even... <laughs> Close. Oh yeah. Okay. So there's apartment or suite number, but now we've got everybody, right? Like <laughs> keep going boss. It's a dark hole. And like you start learning about the complexity of all the different ways that postal mail can possibly work in all the different places around the world. And like, my God, it's fairly complicated or even things like names, right? First name, middle initial, last name. I got you people of the world. Like <laughs> No, you don't. <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that, right? right. And I think that this is where uh, the culture that you've been in, the culture that you're used to, can be informative as to not only the norms, but your concept of what constitutes a universal ideal of this is what a name is, and um, this is how to think about humans' names. And it's like, well, uh, you need to get out of the house, right? Because like, turns out there are a lot of different ways of reasoning about names that get increasingly complicated. Things that seem very simple, like, 
I want to present an alphabetized sorted list. Well, what do you mean by alphabetized, right? It's like A to Z, of course. And it's like, okay, but what about accented characters, right? What about a German double S? What about an A with a circle around it, right? Um, you know, does that come before or after regular A? Does it come at the end of the alphabet? What if I told you it depends on where you are uh, and, and that the different sorts can, be, can depend on different conventions that are, are, are regionalized to different areas. And so you have to, uh, there isn't one correct way to sort it. You have to ask the question, for whom am I sorting this? Right? Like, oh God, <laughs> you're in Switzerland. What part of Switzerland are you in? Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I think there's a lot of complexity. And I think in a large company, you at least have some people who have had exposure to these problems who can go and slap some sense into you. At a small company, you're having to reinvent these things. Time zones, right? Well, we've got integer time zones, right? Are you, you know, G GMT minus seven? Like, okay, daylight savings time. Okay, what part of Arizona are you in? Because <laughs> part of Arizona uses daylight savings time. But okay, daylight savings and, and then integer time zones. Ooh, there's some people on half, half hour time zones. Okay, okay. I'll take that in. It's a little weird, but I'll do that. Oh, Nepal, you're killing me. <laughs> it's not on a 30 minute boundary. It's on a 45 minute boundary. <laughs> like, ah, oh, right. And then sometimes different places can decide by jurisdiction that they're going to change their dates for when daylight saving starts and stops. So you actually, um, you don't know yet, uh, 10 years from now, uh, when daylight savings will begin in Brazil. You have to wait for the Brazilian legislature to actually go and pass that legislation and then update your time zone code accordingly. Like, Huh. Uh, so so um, it, it, there's so many different things where it's like, it can't possibly be that hard, where it turns out there is, if you really want to make something that's useful by everyone on earth, um, it, it can be astonishingly co complex to ingest and normalize the data because a lot of the, the data is correct. It's not that somebody botched it and messed up the columns, which we were talking about earlier. The data is real, but it's the, the, the reality is of a different form factor than you were expecting. Oh my goodness, you have done an amazing job of actually explaining this. And we won't get into this uh, right now, maybe a later segment, but really it's about data democratization, right? Um, the complexity of data is so important that when you're building solutions or working with it, it's very important to know who you're working or building solution for. That's a key aspect that's not, in my opinion, um, it's not talked about quite a bit and it's, it's very, very important. Who owns the data, not who owns the data, but who is the result of the data going to be laid it on. That should be the starting point in terms of who you build a solution from, from that data. That's right. That's fantastic. I think we've talked quite a bit and we've loved having you, David. Thank you very much. So folks, you have it. Real world data is very complex. And so David, <laughs> before we wrap up, why don't you tell us a little bit about MedCoder and what we should be looking forward to? Sure, so MedQuarter here uh, was something that I built when my dad got prostate cancer and we found that there was a lot of rich, complicated information that his oncologist was telling him in the consults that wasn't making it into his after visit summary, wasn't in the discharge notes. So the only way to really get full advantage of understanding what his doctors were telling him was to record the consult. My dad would do that, he'd email it to me, I was on the other coast, 3000 miles away. I'd listen to the whole thing, I'd type up a summary, I'd link out uh, terms that were used that I wasn't familiar with, and then I'd go and email the rest of the family. And that worked really well for getting us all on the same page, but it was a huge amount of work and it became clear that most families and didn't really have this workflow. So I started designing MedCorder about three and a half years ago. And then um, two years ago, we came up with our first beta version. And a few weeks after we released it, my aunt Terry got diagnosed with multiple myeloma and she started using the app even in its uh, terrible early crashy state. And they found it incredibly useful. And the fact that this embarrassingly poor app um, could be so useful to somebody who I really loved and cared about told me I need to take this seriously. So I quit my job at Google and I went full time on MedQuarter. I put together a team, I raised the seed round, and we built a, a much a higher quality application now for uh, Apple and Android devices. We've got tens of thousands of patients across the United States using us to better understand what their doctors are telling them and to share that with their family members. Because recordings are a proven way for patients to better understand their doctors, to have better comprehension, better retention, better compliance, and we believe we'll ultimately be able to show better outcomes. So that's what MedQuarter is about, short for Medical Recorder. You can find it in the App Store. Right. 
Thank you very much. We look forward to having that. I'm certainly going to download that and share that with all my friends and colleagues as well to, to basically make use of it. So thank you again, David. It was fantastic having you. I'm sure we'd we'll love to have you again in future segments to have further anecdotes and discussions about data. Well, for more data science insights and future installments of Data Science Simplified, just subscribe to our YouTube channel, Data Products. You can also follow us on Facebook at Data Products LLC or on Twitter at Data Products. Well, thank you for your time and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.